Hey, hello, how are you? This is a show for everyone else. Instead of going after top 1% of the world, we dedicate this podcast to celebrate the lives of the unsung heroes and self-made artists. Hi guys, you're listening to the Face World podcast. I am your host, Fei Wu. We're approaching a new milestone of 150 episodes. I, again, cannot believe that I'm saying that. And we're now three and a half years into podcasting. Well, our English version of the podcast continues to thrive, and that enables us to reach a wider audience with this universal language. Meanwhile, Face World is now producing a new series of Chinese episodes for our audience in China, and they will be released on Simalaya.fm. This year, in 2018, Simalaya.fm is a platform with over 500 million users. That actually doubles the number of users on iTunes. To learn more, go to faceworld.com forward slash newsletter. While I was in China in March doing some research and recording new episodes for the new show, focusing on unsung heroes, particularly in the areas of entrepreneurship and philanthropy, I had the great opportunity to meet Professor Zhong Shangzhi, who is a recognized expert and pioneer in medicine. In China, last name comes first, so it's Professor Zhong. Previously, the president of the Chinese University Hong Kong School of Medicine, and he was the youngest president in that school's history. Professor Zhong graduated from the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and worked at Prince of Wales Hospital in Hong Kong. At the age of 50, he refers to that as his midlife crisis. He went to Papua New Guinea, the land of the unexpected and worked there as a doctor under often extreme circumstances with limited medical and human resources. What I also found out is that Professor Zhong was a key contributor and also known to be one of the heroes during SARS in southern China between 2002 and 2003. This is a very short interview. Professor Zhong had a very busy schedule that day, but I couldn't possibly give up this interview. To learn more about Professor Zhong, I hope that you read Chinese, and then you will check out his book, The Kindness Cut. Without further ado, please enjoy this short and heartfelt episode with Professor Zhong Shangzhi. I'll see you at the end of the show. Thank you so much for being here. I love interviewing doctors and talking about medicine on the show, even though I'm, I don't have any experience at all. I didn't go to medical school. Uh, I have tremendous amount of respect for people in your field. Actually, I would love to have you do a brief introduction of who you are and, and what you do to my audience. Uh, my name is Sydney. Um, I'm from Hong Kong, uh, but I went to medical school in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, after I finished my training, went back to Hong Kong and trained as a surgeon there. And I uh, was fortunate at that time, it was the uh, development of uh, endoscopic surgery is uh, very much on the rise. So I was very fortunate to be there at the right time. I uh, worked in a medical school in Hong Kong, worked my way up, and then until I was 50, and then uh, I suppose you can call that a midlife crisis. And then I uh, went to Papua New Guinea and took up the post of professor there mm -hmm. and worked there for a few years, uh, three years to be exact. And that was the uh, most rewarding three years of my life. Wow. Why, why do you think it was the most rewarding years of your life? Um, it was uh, very challenging to be working as a doctor in the third world where the resources are very limited. So we have no option but to go back 
to first principles and solve clinical problems and make the diagnosis by listening to the patient, by actually laying our hands on the patient to make the diagnosis, and then to try to solve the problem with the very limited resources. Mm -hmm. I mean, here we could order blood tests, x-rays, CT scans, mm -hmm. and have a range of the various wonderful drugs and um, other technologies available to us. But when it was in Papua New Guinea, we really have to rely on our senses to make the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And then after we make the diagnosis, have to look at what we have available and, uh, you know, make do with what we have. Most of the time, we will be able to actually solve the problem uh, and make the patient better. And that is the rewarding part of it. For those three years, I want to catch the city you mentioned. Um, where was well, Port Mosby? Wow. So uh, I I've heard so many different stories, and I've spoken with a lot of Chinese doctors, who uh, in many cases they're still working in the U.S. You know, and the, uh, I guess the salary is really good with a lot of rewards and a lot of resources. Uh, why did you choose to go to a third world country at that time? I think that has always been my dream since. I went to medical school, but then I was working in Hong Kong, working in a new medical school. Uh, life was really busy and uh, going to the hospital day after day, seeing patients, teaching students, writing papers, doing research. And then suddenly you realize that maybe there's more to life than that. Maybe there's more to life than making more money. Maybe that's more to life than getting more famous. Mm -hmm. Why not fulfill my childhood dream while I'm still physically and mentally capable of doing it? Mm -hmm. So I took a deep breath and leapt. What, what was your childhood dream? Um, what were you thinking when you were... I read stories about uh, the Canadian doctor, Norman Bethune, that worked in China uh, with the uh, Red Army, and I, was, I read a story about him operating on the uh, soldiers of the Red Army in a, a decrepit temple and managed to save the life of the soldiers. And I thought, well, that was maybe something worth doing. How old were you approximately when you read the story? Fifteen. Oh, wow. So... One thing I read that jumped out at me was your contribution to SARS. Yeah, well, what, it was so scary. I still remember a lot of, I was in um, the U.S. at the time, but it was impacting my parents and everybody I, I knew in China. Yeah, I think uh, thinking back, if you have a disease that uh, you don't know what it is mm -hmm. and you don't know uh, how it is spread, but all you can see is your colleagues uh, falling one by one. Yeah, your right face is pretty scary. Mm -hmm. Wow. So what did you uh, manage to do? I mean, it was such a scary time for doctors because you are the frontier. But I can imagine some doctors would probably turn away from it because there's no solution, there's no guarantee. Well, direct, uh, uh -huh. I'm actually very proud to say that that didn't happen in Hong Kong because... Uh, uh, everyone uh, from the doctors to the porters in the hospital uh, uh, stuck to their guns. In fact, the security guy uh, who was um, uh, posted right outside the SARS ward came up to me and says, uh, Professor Chung, uh, don't you worry, I'll stay here. I said, hmm. That's something. <laughs> wow. Even the security guard. Even the security guard. Wow. There are so many stories too. I didn't I didn't read any of this on, online. I'm just really thrilled to to be part of this conversation. One thing I read is that you also um, authored a book called in Chinese called uh Dao Xia Liu Ren. Yes. It was translated to English as well. It's called The Kindest Cut. Wow. I very much 
love that because I've had several family members who have gone through surgeries, and I lost my dad to cancer about 10, nearly 10 years ago, and he also went through surgery, but not, not a very successful one. So what triggered or what inspired you to write a book? Well, I worked as a doctor for a number of years, and of, of course, uh, as a doctor, you can impact on people's lives by treating the disease, operating on them, and so on. I also taught in the medical school for a number of years. Maybe the impact is bigger because you can inspire and educate the next generation of youngsters to be good doctors. But then if I write a book, if I can inspire more people to be good doctors, maybe that is even more meaningful. So that was the motivation behind uh, writing about my own experience when I was a medical student, while I was uh, treating patients, while I was teaching medical students. So there were uh, so many funny stories I can tell as a surgeon. Don't ask a surgeon to start telling you war stories because there'll be no end to it. Uh, Well, maybe share one story if you have the time. Uh, One story. I think in that book, uh, the story that my readers have found more resonance was was not actually a success story. It was a story about a very good friend of mine who I had to look after, but I missed the diagnosis. I missed the diagnosis of um, cancer of the pancreas, and uh, he died. Mm-hmm. To be able to talk about that uh, must be really difficult. Uh, No, to be able to face his family was the most difficult because his wife was too understanding, but his his mother never forgave me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's the toughest part to be a doctor is the amount of not just pressure, but the amount of expectation that's let on you from so many different aspects. It's not just the treatment itself, but also the way you talk to people, the way, the way that you make them feel. And also for you to have to do all of that, if I can just be honest, I think it's too much because that's one area that I've inserted a lot of my energy into is palliative care. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something I've literally devoted the past year or so interviewing doctors from that discipline. Actually, my wife is a palliative care doctor. No way. In Hong Kong. Yes. I, I think that's the most promising, the m- most needed field. And I the doctors I know in Boston work closely with oncologists. So together, I interviewed both of them together. And I just think it's too much for oncologists to have to do everything, cancer doctors in general. Yeah, I, know I think you could say that because you cannot be a good doctor without caring. And yet if you care too much then your judgment may also be colored. So um, it's a fine path. Mm -hmm. I think I really appreciate you sharing that story because it's a beautiful thing for me to witness of talking to, I I interview a lot of people that I'm only meeting for the first time. Hey, it's Faye. I am back for a few words at the end of the show. I hope you enjoy what you heard. You can visit us online at faceworld.com or social channels such as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, also under FaceWorld to keep things simple. I personally review and respond to all the messages. Love to hear from you. Thank you and lots of hugs. See you next week. <laughs>